And now we're going to look at a section about the priests. So that's one of the major categories that Leviticus deals with is the Levites or the priests and their job and responsibility and how they make all the sacrifices and offerings happen. Um, before we get into all that, I was asked last week what I recommend for reading plans. I think we have a printed out uh, Bible reading plan out there, which is great. Um, if you want to do the Bible in a year or New Testament or Old Testament in a year, that's a wonderful plan. Usually my recommendation to folks is to just pick one Bible, and book of the Bible, and go a little bit slower and, and pace yourself. Um, and then someone asks me what I do. You don't want to do what I do. Um, <laughs> so I'm currently translating the letters of John. So we'll see how that goes. That's my devotion life. But for most folks, I recommend you start small rather than saying, I'm going to do this whole big thing. Well, just get into a slow devotional habit. And so maybe just pick a book of the Bible or two books of the Bible and kind of go through those prayerfully is usually what I recommend. Okay. Um, Leviticus chapter 8 today has to do with the priests. It is the ordination and the beginning of instructions for Aaron and his sons and the priests. Now, there's going to be a lesson here on how to read the Bible. Okay, so in your Bible, you have prophecies, right? God says something will happen in the future. We see that promise fulfilled. Sometimes that promise is fulfilled in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's fulfilled in Christ in the New Testament, and other times it's going to be fulfilled even in the future, which is why we have Revelation giving us promises, right? So a popular one, Isaiah talks about a virgin giving birth to a son, and Matthew says, guess what? <laughs> that happened. His name's Jesus. All right. So we all understand that, that that's part of how we read the Bible is that we look at the New Testament, we see how God has kept his promises and fulfilled those for us in Christ or through the church. Another way of uh, understanding what's going on in the Old Testament is something called uh, types, or if you did literature or English a lot in college and high school, you would say more like foreshadowing kind of, okay? Um, but what theologians call it is types. So Moses is a type of Christ, right? That he's a prophet who leads his people out of bondage and slavery, right? Christ comes, he even calls going to the cross as Exodus. He leads us out of slavery and bondage to sin. So uh, Moses becomes a type or foreshadowing of what God will ultimately do for us in salvation through Jesus. Does that kind of make sense? All right. <clears throat> so this is important for reading your Bible because what the apostles did is after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit comes into them and enlightens them and guides them and they begin writing the scriptures, they are re-understanding what Jesus did and what the Old Testament taught in light of this is the Christ. Does that make like they they had to re kind of understand and configure everything and say now we read the Bible in light of Jesus that Jesus has come so he's he's the lens that we view everything through. One of the things that um, theologians have done when talking about Jesus is the phrase prophet, priest, and king. You may have heard of this that Jesus is the ultimate prophet, the ultimate priest, the ultimate king and that in the old testament you have king david but jesus is the better ultimate king david it's, it's on his throne right you have prophets like moses jesus is the better moses the better prophet and then you have priests like melchizedek and aaron and others and jesus becomes the ultimate high priest is what the new testament says all right so Part of what we're going to see in Leviticus 8 is that um, it's a foreshadowing of what does a priest do for God's people. And that we, we end up seeing ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. The other thing that we're going to see, because Jesus changed everything, okay, <laughs> quite literally, um, that in the New Testament, things change. So 
it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio when you're going from Old Testament to New Testament, right? That there is a new covenant. Things have changed because of Jesus. And, and what do we learn and, and see how the New Testament authors talk about these things and the language that they use basically for the New Testament church? Okay, so the thing about priests, if you can't keep up with anything else that I ramble on today, here's the big thing about priests in the Old Testament. They were mediators. Okay, that's the big thing about what a priest's job was, was to be a mediator between God and the people. They are the ones that oversaw and brought the offerings and sacrifices on behalf of the people to God. And they are the ones that would also turn around and announce God's mercy and forgiveness to the people. So the priest is the mediator. This is going to be important when you get to Jesus. Okay, so a couple of verses just to, from the New Testament to help us connect it to Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, Paul says, For there is one God... And there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, right? So Paul is saying the old way of the Levitical priests is gone. We have Jesus. We have no need for any other mediator because he's the one, right? He's the one that stands between us and God who um, takes our sins and makes the sacrifice on our behalf. And he's the one that announces God's grace and forgiveness to us. He is the mediator now. And then Hebrews chapter 13, um, we don't know who wrote it. I think Paul wrote Hebrews, and I have a wonderful argument about why. So anyway, I go with Paul. You can pick whoever you want because we don't know. All right, through him, that is through Jesus, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So in Jesus, we bring our offering, we bring our sacrifice, right? Just like in the Leviticus in the Old Testament, the people would bring their offerings or sacrifice to the priests and the Levites, and they would assist in the making of it. We bring, and the reason I share this out of here is because they're using the sacrifice language, right? We talked about this the last couple of weeks that a lot of times we have that disconnect because it's been so long since this time period and because we have Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice we kind of think about oh well that sacrificial system it's all gone and yeah it is Jesus came he, he fulfilled it for us and that's the good news <laughs> okay um, but the New Testament authors still relied on that language when talking about how we worship and live all right and that's what Hebrews is saying is that through Jesus no we're still bringing a sacrifice we're still bringing an offering but it's but it's one of praise and worship of him, right? It's not of goats and calves and things like that, right? But they're still using this language from Leviticus. All right, so that's kind of just the broad overview to kind of give us a framework that ultimately Jesus fulfills this. Um, ultimately, he's the, he's the great mediator between us and God. All right, but in Leviticus 8 is the backdrop for Jesus being a priest, why it matters. All right, so what's happening in Leviticus 8 is Aaron and his sons are presented publicly before the congregation to be ordained to serve God as priests. And this is a big deal that it's done publicly. The whole congregation witnesses it. So in Leviticus 8 verse 1 says, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him and the garments and the anointing oil and the bowl, the sin offering, the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him and the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So that's the tabernacle. So they're getting the whole church together to consecrate, ordain, install, whatever language you want to use, Aaron and his sons as the priests, and Aaron as the high priest. Now here's why this matters that it's done publicly. Um, and this is where we get our tradition in the New Testament church. It still happens that ordinations and installations and things like that are done publicly because it protects the people of God it protects the church from rogue theologians, okay? <laughs> it protects the congregation and the church 
from someone going, well, God told me that I should do this. God has anointed me. God has made me a prophet. And you're sitting there going, I don't know. I've known you for a long time, and I'm not so sure that you're a prophet or that you're this thing, right? And so it's done publicly um, to protect the congregation, to protect the people um, from false teachers and things like that, of people just being able to say, I mean, isn't that kind of like the ultimate in church? Like, well, the Lord told me. And so once I say that, now if you disagree with me, guess what? I've put you in a position of, well, you don't disagree with me. You're disagreeing with the Lord. Right now, <laughs> that's not a great way to treat people. And it's also, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of Bible passages that talk about um, how to evaluate when people say those things. But um, it, it protects from that, right? It guards against that. God's saying, I want you to worship properly. I want these uh, rituals and these sacrifices and offerings to be done in holy accordance with my word. So instead of having someone just come up and say, I want to do it, or I think God has said I should do it, and everybody else going, well, the Lord said, it's brought before the whole congregation to kind of evaluate. And this is where this tradition comes from, and it's carried over into the New Testament that um, anytime anybody in the New Testament is supposed to be um, installed or, or put to, up as an apostle or an elder, it was always done publicly before the congregation and basically, hey, does anybody have a reason knowing this person and their character and the theology why they shouldn't serve in this way, all right? Um, and this is why to this day, my ordination was public. <laughs> it was, it's not done in secret. It's like everybody's there. You got a bunch of other pastors that were basically saying, we trust this weirdo, all right? <laughs> and, and everybody else is there. So does that make sense, though, that this is why God would say, no, I want you to, I want you to bring everybody in. The other reason they bring everybody in is because one of the jobs of the priest is to represent the people before God. It's showing the people, Aaron and his sons are your priests. They represent you before God, right? That we're in this together, all right? All right, so um, turning back to Exodus 40, just have to go left a little bit. Exodus chapter 40, there's a little bit more instructions on this whole process. Um, <clears throat> so in Exodus 40, verse 12, they've just put the tabernacle up for the first time. It says, Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting, shall wash them with water, and put on Aaron the holy garments, and you shall anoint him and consecrate him, that he may serve me as a priest. You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. And we'll talk about that line in a little bit. What Leviticus 8 is, is taking that event from Exodus 40 and kind of expanding upon it with more detailed instructions and from God about what they're going to do. All right. <clears throat> now, this whole setting apart, being publicly de dedicated or declared to serve God. That's what's happening, right? The Aaron and his sons and his descendants are being set apart by God in front of everybody saying, they have a specific role amongst my people. Now, <clears throat> we have this to an extent in the New Testament church, but like I said earlier, it's not always a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Because we're not making high priests anymore. And we don't have a tabernacle and all of that anymore. But we do have the practice from the New Testament of laying hands on people, of consecrating them or setting them apart to say they are now serving the church and God's people in this role. So um, I just want to share a few New Testament passages. One of my favorites, Acts chapter 6. The whole chapter is really good. Acts chapter 6. They have a problem in the New Testament church which, you know, what else is new? People are grumbling and complaining, so they come to the apostles and point out some bad stuff that's happening, and the solution is to form a committee. I'm just, just kidding, that didn't happen. All right. The solution is to essentially consecrate or set apart 
some people to serve in that specific way. So Acts 6, verse 6, 6 says this, These they set apart before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. All right, so this is in reference to the seven deacons, and Stephen is one of them. He's the guy that gets martyred. The issue was there was uh, Hebrew Christians, and there were Greek-speaking Christians, and the Hebrew ones were being favored. And so that wasn't right in terms of the bread distribution and help for the widows and the poor. And so they came to the apostles and said, fix it. <laughs> and the apostles prayed about it, and they said, we need to be set apart for the teaching and the preaching of God's word. So pick from amongst yourself. Again, it's from the congregation, right? Like we saw in Leviticus, seven people. I don't know why they picked seven. They did. Seven people to serve in this way that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we know their faith, we know their character, we know that they believe in Jesus and love the church, right, essentially. So he's saying set them apart to serve in this way. And that's what's happening here in Acts chapter 6. And then they lay hands on them, they pray over them, and then these seven people become deacons, right? They become servants in the church, and their role is to make sure that a ministry of mercy and care for church members is happening. And the apostles are set aside for the preaching of God's word. Now, <clears throat> one quick thing. Um, it's not necessarily a quick thing. I think it's quick. All right. <laughs> is what has happened 2,000 years later, okay, for, is that we have taken that distinction that the apostles were set aside for the preaching of the word, which was needed for the church, and that the deacons were set aside for the mercy ministry, which was needed for the health of the, and growth of the church. And if you read verse 7, that's what happens. The church grows because they stay healthy. What's happened nowadays is that um, we've created this false dichotomy of the, the <laughs> what I do, <laughs> the preaching of the word, is more important and more needed than the other stuff. All right. Um, this happens a lot in our day and age. And here's how I know it happens a lot because I see it. And then people will come up to me and say, well, I can't do what you do. Or I can't, I don't have that gift or whatever. Well, good. <laughs> like God gifted the whole church in different ways on purpose so we could be healthy. So that we could love people. That we could do the things he has called us to do. So here's the point that I want to make when the apostles say we're going to be dedicated and set to the service of the word and then i want you to set aside some folks for the service of this bread ministry this mercy ministry they use the same word the apostles like these guys that stephen and all those that get set aside to serve they're called deacons when the apostles say we're going to be servants of the word in greek they use the same word deacon we're going to be deacons of the word. We're going to be, right? So we're all serving God. We're all serving the church the way mm -hmm. he, he has called us and set us apart. And we all just have different ways of doing that. Does that make sense? All right. And this is why I bring it up because there's this weird, like, <laughs> separation of, like, over here you got the people doing the holy work. And over here you got people doing the other stuff. And the Bible says it's all holy, right? It, it's, it's all set apart for the glory of God and the good of the church and the loving of people. And the, even the apostles themselves <laughs> call themselves deacons of the word. Like, like that's, we're all serving the church. We just have different gifts and ways of doing it. Um, Acts chapter 13, we get another instance of laying on hands of people being um, set apart. And this is Barnabas and Saul. He goes back and forth between Saul and Paul. All right. um, Barnabas means son of encouragement. He's a really nice guy. Um, sadly, eventually him and Paul get into a fight and they split up and go on different trips. So even back then, people disagreed and didn't always work out. 
But in Acts chapter 13 says this, starting at verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now this is crucial. This is really cool. I love the book Acts. This is a really great book. We should read it again together. All right. Um, <laughs> that'll be our next Bible study. Maybe. I don't know. You guys can pick. All right. <laughs> I always ask for suggestions and everybody just goes, Whatever you pick. Okay. Now you're stuck with Leviticus. Okay. <laughs> this is really important. Verse 3 matters so much because for most people, verse 2 would be enough. The Holy Spirit said, like we're in a church service, and the Holy Spirit speaks, and everybody hears and says, set apart Saul and Barnabas. Most of us would be like, that's good enough. It's the Holy Spirit said to do it. And we all heard him, right? This is not Saul showing up on his own going, you know, the Holy Spirit told me last night in a dream to do, right? This is, they are gathered for worship. They are in the church service and the Holy Spirit audibly speaks. Most of us, if that happened, I'll, at least for me, I'd be like, that is good enough for me. I, I take your word for it, Lord. But what happens in verse three? After fasting and praying about it, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They, like, you see what's happening? It's still within the congregation. It's still within the people. And they're still saying, we are praying for you. We're laying hands on you. And we are setting you apart to say, we know this is what the Lord wants you to do. And I think that's really neat that it, it doesn't just skip verse 3, that it's actually there. It says, no, they still laid hands and prayed for them and then sent them off. All right, and then First Timothy uh, chapter 4. Timothy was one of Paul's uh, companions and students. And so Paul wrote him some letters to help him out. So First Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Paul tells Timothy in a word of encouragement, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. All right, so the reason I bring this up is what we see in Exodus 40 and Leviticus 8 with Aaron and his sons being brought before the congregation. And as we're reading Leviticus 8, you're going to see that Moses touches them and lays hands on them and sprinkles blood on them and all kinds of stuff. That they're being separated out. This practice continues in the New Testament, not necessarily with the high priests and the sprinkling of blood, but the laying on of hands in front of the congregation, being called by God, but also approved by the church that knows these men and women and saying, we see this in your life, we're laying hands on you, we're praying for you, and you are going to be serving the church and the Lord in this way. All right? Does that make sense? Okay, so the the New Testament kept this practice going, this tradition of laying on of hands and separating people out and saying, in this way, they're going to be serving the church and the Lord. And they prayed for them, which is why when you go to an installation or an ordination, you see a bunch of other pastors come up and they will lay hands on the newbie. And then they give you a stole, and that's when you're actually a pastor. Because you can't wear one until you're ordained. Did you know that? Well, now you do. There you go. You learned some Bible class. Totally worth coming. That's, I'm not joking. I really like, when you're a vicar, if you wear a stole, you have to wear it as a sideways sash to indicate you're still a vicar. You're not ordained. That's when you get all the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's what all the old pastors joke about when you're getting ordained. Because they're whispering to you. Y'all don't know it, but there's like all kinds of little conversations going on when you're up on that kneeler getting ordained. And you're trying not to chuckle the whole time. <laughs> all right. So they are being set apart. We're going back to Leviticus chapter 8. They're being set apart. They're being pulled in front of the whole congregation. And the whole point is so that they can serve, not so that they can have power over the people. Okay. And that's a big 
thing that is oftentimes forgotten even to this day, right? That the role that Aaron and his sons were set apart for was one of service to the people and to God, not so that they could be in charge and lord it over the people, right? So in Exodus 28 on your hand out there, uh, God is talking about how um, Aaron and his sons are to be dressed and clothed. He's describing the robes and the turban and everything. And he says, <laughs> you shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. All right. So they would wear this up here on their turbans. So that anybody that looked at them said, oh, we know what they're they're for. They're, they are holy. They are set apart for serving the Lord as priests. And part of their job as priests is also to serve the people with their sacrifices. So Leviticus 8, starting at verse 5, Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the coat on him and tied the sash around his waist and clothed them with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied this skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastplate on him. And in the breastplate, he put the urim and the thummim. These are, uh, lack of a better word, dice that God had ordained and told them to cast as lots whenever they needed um, insight on what does God want us to do. Because um, they were all nervous about Moses dying. <laughs> They're like, he's getting old. We walked around in that desert for a long time. <laughs> when he's gone, how do we know what you want us to do? And so God gave them the Urim and the Thummim, and these were used to cast lots. Um, and then God said, I will give instruction on how to understand them. And All right, so... That's why they're being put there, because it was part of the job of the high priest is to guide the people in the way of following God. And he set the turban, so this is the Exodus 28 verse, turban on his head, and on the turban in front, he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. And so Exodus 28 that I read to you tells you what was engraved on it. It's a reminder of your role, Aaron. This is your job. You've been set apart for the Lord's service and for service to the people. All right, Alan Mosley, he wrote a fun little commentary on Leviticus. There's, I have a bunch. If you want one, let me know, and you can have a copy. Um, his is a little more accessible um, than others, but what he says about this passage, he says, the colors were important because those were also the colors of the tabernacle's curtain and veils. So the priest matched the tabernacle, and the colors show that the priest and the tabernacle went together. So um, he read in other parts of the Bible of all the colors of the robes that they were wearing and everything. And if you have a study Bible, a lot of times they'll have like uh, colored pictures to illustrate it for you. And that's really helpful. Um, <clears throat> and his point is that even their clothing is a reminder of they've been set apart for this specific role. All right. Now, <clears throat> the tradition of clergy uh, wearing specific clothing to kind of distinguish is still going on. I, I also wear it because it's slimming, you know, black with vertical stripes. Everybody goes, wow, you look so good. I'm like, I'm wearing a giant cape. I could be five, you know, like I could gain like 100 pounds and still look good on that robe. All right, it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> now there's reason for some of the colors. We wear a white, white robe in order to signify um, being made holy by God through baptism and his grace and mercy that we're sinners like everybody else. Now, the clerical. I've heard a bajillion legends on the clerical, where it came from, and why it looks like it. So I don't think anybody really knows. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've had professors tell me different things, and they disagreed with each other, so I just picked the one I liked the most because it made sense. And I'm going to tell you that one, okay? We wear black to signify that we're sinners. And you have a white piece over your voice box to signify that the only thing that matters that's holy about you is the pure word of God that you preach and teach. 
I have no idea if that's true, but I like it a lot. So I just, I've been running with that for like since seminary, okay? Um, I'm sure there's other theories or history behind it. That's what one of my professors told me. I thought it was cool. Makes sense. Whatever. I also have friends with Hawaiian shirt clericals, and I don't really know what's going on with that religiously, <laughs> uh, but they look neat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, we still have the tradition within certain church traditions of um, the clergy wearing certain garb, garbs and garments to kind of distinguish and say, this role has been set apart to serve God um, in this specific way, right? So that's what's going on with this. <laughs> Um, and so the clothing becomes a reminder of <clears throat> um, that they are there to serve the tabernacle with the offerings and the sacrifices. One other thing about um, Aaron's garb that the priests would have um, basically a breastplate of 12 stones, right? And the 12 stones were specific types of stones you could read about in Exodus. And they represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And so the the colors of the clothing match the tabernacle to remind them you're serving God. And then they carry the 12 stones on their breastplate to remind them you're also serving God's people, right? It's all about being set apart to serve, not set apart to have authority and control over everybody. Um, in Matthew 20, Jesus says, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, right? Very famous verse from Jesus. Um, and so it's always a good reminder that if Jesus, the creator of the universe, the ruler of all things, says, I'm a servant, it's okay for us to view ourselves as servants and to be servants, right? And Jesus has a lot to say about power, authority, service, and all that in the Gospels. All right, so <clears throat> I just want to really emphasize that it's, it's meant to be a position of service, not power and authority. Sometimes that gets forgotten throughout the Old Testament, gets forgotten in the New Testament. Unfortunately, it still gets forgotten to this day. Um, you know, There's a reason we even say it in our liturgy as an ordained and called servant of Christ and the Word, right? That's from... Acts, remember, we're servants of the word. That's all I am. That's why I just say all the time, open a Bible. That's all I got. All right. So they were called to a position of service. All right. And then they're consecrated to serve in a specific way. And this is going to happen with anointing. So in verse 10 of Leviticus 8, Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it which, by the way, probably took a long time because the tabernacle's huge and they got a lot of stuff <laughs> in there. So Moses was like, all right, going around for a while. And he consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate <laughs> them. So even all of the tools, right, everything being used is uh, consecrated and being set apart saying, you know, this basin, this bowl, this thing over here, you might have a common version of it in your house, but this one over here is being set apart for serving the Lord in this specific way. All right. In verse 12, he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with the coats and tied sashes around their waist and bowed caps on and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. All right, so Aaron and the tabernacle and everything in the tabernacle that's going to be used in these priestly roles and his sons are consecrated with anointing oil. Now, <clears throat> this continues to happen throughout the Old Testament. Anointing of, with oil is a very common practice. It happened in the New Testament. Um, it's also used as a way of treating illnesses. All right, um, they were put different oils. This is why James encourages prayers to happen and for anointing with oil to happen when people are sick, because back then that was medicine. All right, <clears throat> anointing with oil is one of those traditions that's kind of fallen out of favor in modern times. It still happens to a small degree, depending on which church tradition you are, but at least for a lot of most Protestants, it doesn't happen so much 
anymore. All right, but we'll talk about the oil and stuff. So Aaron and his sons are anointed with oil to be signified being separated out for a specific purpose. Here's the other thing about anointing. Anointed is the word Meshiach in Hebrew. This is where we get the word Messiah or in Greek, Christ. So to be the Messiah meant you were the anointed one. We even have that expression in English, right? The anointed one. Okay, that's where this comes from. So Aaron is a Meshiach in the small sense, right? He is anointed to bring about forgiveness of sins to his people through the sacrifices. When David is set apart by Jesse to be king, he's what? Anointed with oil. All right, so it was meant as a way to separate someone out for a specific uh, role in which they were going to serve God. So some prophets were anointed, kings were anointed, the priests were anointed. Um, <clears throat> and then you ultimately have the ultimate anointed one, the Messiah, all right? And this is why in some English translations are good about this. When they're talking about Jesus, the apostles in the New Testament will say Jesus and some English translations say the Christ, all right? Some say Jesus Christ. Some will keep the word the there. And that's done on purpose because it's Jesus and he is the anointed one. Like he's the anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ that we've been waiting for. We've had all these other little ones who served as priests and kings, but now we have the ultimate one, right? Um, Alan Mosley, again, in his commentary in Leviticus, says this about anointing. He says, anointing is a symbol that refers to God blessing us with position and power. So part of what happened was a symbol of this person has been consecrated and separated out to serve in this way, but it was also a symbol of God's spirit being poured out upon you to empower you to serve in that way, to be a king, to be a priest, to be a prophet, right? When Jesus begins his ministry in the Gospel of Luke, right, he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, says, He has anointed me with power, with the Spirit, to preach good news to the poor and to loose the bonds, right? Jesus says it. He says, I've, I've been anointed by the Spirit. I'm, like, I'm, the Spirit is upon me and empowering me, right? So for the people of God going all the way back to the Old Testament, anointing did those two things or symbolized those two things. You're set apart to serve. God's also empowering you to serve in that way. Um, so a couple of things about oil because we kind of don't do it too often anymore. <clears throat> um, we don't do it too often anymore. Um, I have anointing oil in my house. It smells like frankincense. It's very nice. Um, I have used it to do house blessings um, when people are very ill. Um, part of our liturgy um, in the commendation of the dying has a place where you can just say the blessing or if you have it with you, you can anoint someone with oil while saying a certain blessing over them. So that's probably the most common this day and age way of oil being used to anoint someone is often more so when someone is ill or wanting spiritual comfort, we'll anoint them with oil, with Harvey. I did it with him when he was passing. So um, it is different nowadays. We were, you know, at my ordination, they didn't pour oil on me. And I'm really glad about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we kind of don't do that anymore. But the tradition of anointing people to spiritual comfort, to remind them of God's presence, that's still around. Um, as James tells us to use it for healing and during prayer. So um, if you ever want me to anoint you with oil and especially, you know, and say a prayer over you or during a visit or someone you love, just let me know. I have it at my house. So there you go. I don't carry it around because I'm always terrified because they come in glass jars, like little vials, and, I, and it stains everything. I know that because it's broken before. So now I'm always nervous that, it'll shatter in my bag and then I'll get to where I'm going and I'll just have a bag full of frankincense and <laughs> have to get a new backpack. All right. <clears throat> okay. 
Uh, more about anointing with the New Testament, what that means for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Apostle Paul is writing to the church. And when he writes to the Corinthian church, he writes a lot about spiritual gifts and being uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, both in 1 and 2 Corinthians. So, 2 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. He says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So what Paul is doing is he's taking the language of the Old Testament of being anointed, which means to be set apart for service and empowered by God for service to God and the church, He's saying, in the New Testament, we've received that anointing through the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is now upon us, and He's anointed all of us as believers to be empowered to serve God with all kinds of different spiritual gifts. Does that make sense? All right, so this is... And then in 1 John chapter 2, it's on your handout, it says, But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. So... There you go. There's the Apostle John writing to the church saying, if you're a believer, you've been anointed by the Holy One. You have the Holy Spirit. You have knowledge about who Jesus is. You have knowledge about how to serve God. This wonderful blessing. All right. <clears throat> the next thing that happens for Aaron and the priests and his sons, uh, Leviticus 8 verse 14, is they have to be uh, purified. They have sinned. Right. Now, I have the practice and the habit of when we do the liturgy and it gets to the part where I say, let us then confess our sins before God our Father, the next line is has a C by it. That means it's your turn. All right. um, <laughs> I read it with you. That's just my personal choice because I'm, I'm still a messed up sinner too. I just happen to be what an ordained messed up sinner okay that's the only difference all right um aaron and the and his sons are sinners so before they serve god in this way they must be consecrated they must be purified of their sin so verse 14 of Leviticus 8 then he brought the bowl of the sin offering and aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bowl of the sin offering that was a way in the sacrificial system we'll talk more about this when we get to uh, the Day of Atonement sacrifice section, um, the laying on hands of the animal was a way of spiritually passing your sin upon it. All right, that way it bears my sin because I've laid my hands on it. <laughs> and he killed it, and Moses took the blood and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar around it and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. And he took all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and Moses burned them on the altar but the bowl and its skin and its flesh and its dung he burned up with fire outside the camp as Lord commanded Moses then there's another sacrifice because they were really bad I don't know <laughs> honestly I don't know God said do it twice and Moses was like okay all right, so verse 18, Then he presented the ram of the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it, and Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burned the head and the pieces and the fat. He washed the entrails and the legs with water, and Moses burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering for the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, we talked about the last couple of weeks, the different types of offerings and sacrifice, both the burnt offering and the sin offering were sacrifices done for forgiveness, for atonement. So Aaron and his sons are being atoned for and having their sins forgiven before they take on the role of the priests being the mediators who would announce forgiveness um, to, to the people. <clears throat> Now, the rest of it gets a little more detailed, so I'm not going to read all of it to you about stuff. They do other stuff. Um, we have a wave offering, which is kind of just what it sounds like. He waves it in the air above them to cover them with stuff. And then he touches them and puts blood on different parts of their body, from their toe up to their earlobes and their nose. 
the reason being that that signifies the blood has covered your your whole being, Aaron. You you are completely covered and forgiven now. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna take that. This the priest needs to be consecrated and set apart. The priest needs to be forgiven, and we're gonna jump to the New Testament. See what the New Testament says for us. So Hebrews chapter seven. Hebrews chapter 7. Verses 26 and 27. This is a chapter or of a section where the author of Hebrews is talking about how Jesus is our high priest. Now, <clears throat> the whole other topic to talk about here which we don't have time for but to be a priest you had to be a descendant of Aaron and be of the tribe of Levi the problem for Jesus because he's of David is of the tribe of Judah so what the author of Hebrews does to solve this dilemma for us is he goes back further before Aaron to a man named Melchizedek who was a priest to Abraham so he uses that as a foreshadowing for Christ that he would be a greater priest because he would be a priest for all people. Okay, So in verses 26 and 27, he's talking about Jesus as our priest. He says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners. He's talking about Christ. And exalted above the heavens, he has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifice daily first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. So what he's saying is Jesus is a better high priest than Aaron and his sons because he's perfect, essentially. He, he's unstained, he's clean, he's holy without needing to atone for any of his own sin because he has none. Whereas Aaron, his sons, and the other priests, every single day before they went to their work, would make a sacrifice for their own sin. And then they could go about the work of doing the sacrifices and offerings for the rest of the people. So Hebrews is saying, thank goodness we have a better high priest. We have Jesus who doesn't need to have his own sins atoned for and doesn't need to make any more sacrifices for the people. Because when he offered himself up, he became the once and for all sacrifice that covers all sins. All right, Second Timothy chapter two, verses twenty and twenty-one. All right, this is now I'm talking about us, okay? Because we're we by being indwelled the Holy Spirit are holy ones okay so <clears throat> when you see the word saints in your New Testament Paul will often address his letters that way he will say to the saints at whatever um, he usually says it to the churches that were doing good <laughs> okay the other church is not doing so good they didn't get called saints but, you know, Paul was a fun guy. Saints is literally a phrase called holy ones. So when Paul writes the church, he says about all the members, even with their sin, you're the holy ones. Right? And we've talked about the holy ones. We're, we're separated out. We are called out by God. We've been consecrated, made holy by God through Jesus to serve him. And Paul talks about this when he's writing to Timothy and to the church about um, how we are separated out from the world to serve God. And 2 Timothy uh, 2 verse 20 says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable... He will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. The master of the house is Jesus, just so you know, not you, <laughs> not me. It's Jesus. So what Paul's saying is, look, there's honorable use vessels, 
right? There's there's stuff that you use for like a nice party and all that, and then there's paper plates, okay? <laughs> and he's using this analogy or this metaphor to illustrate for us what happens when, through the grace of God, we've been cleansed from all that's dishonorable, from all of our ugliness and our sin. We've been cleansed, we've been made clean, so we've been taken from being dishonorable, meant to throw away dishware, to fine china. And he's saying now, because of that, you are set apart, you are holy, you are consecrated because of the blood of Jesus to serve the master of the house with every good work, to serve God with every good work. All right, so that's Paul, not just talking to Timothy, but to the whole church. So you've all been made holy and cleansed and set apart by God for good works. All right, and then another one, 1 John <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. You know these ones, by the way. Probably. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, here's our language from Leviticus, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's your line in the liturgy. Come on, there's a big C by it in your bulletin and everything. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you see the language that the apostles are using is this Leviticus language of, hey, just like the priests were cleansed of their sin and set apart to serve God, because of Jesus and his forgiveness, we as his people have now been cleansed of our sins, made holy and set apart to serve him. And this is why you have in the New Testament, Peter and the apostles picking up on the language from Leviticus and Exodus that we are a kingdom of priests. All right. So yeah, you had the high priest and you had the sons and everything else, but the whole nation of Israel was considered by God to be a kingdom of priests because they were all forgiven, they were all consecrated and made holy to serve him. And the New Testament authors are saying, that's now true for us in the church because of what Jesus has done. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now, the rest of Leviticus 8 has to do with what Aaron and his sons will do, that they will serve God in this way and in this holy way by bringing the sacrifices and the offerings and all that stuff. <clears throat> all right. So, for us in the New Testament, what does that look like? Because... You're like, I want to obey the Bible. But how many of you are going to go out and butcher an animal tonight and sprinkle some blood around? Probably. Probably not. <laughs> right? Even if you're doing a barbecue, probably already got it pre-cut. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what does this have to do with us? Well, Romans chapter 12, very famous chapter. It's about spiritual gifts and serving the Lord, the whole chapter. Is. Verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This whole sentence is Leviticus language. It's a sacrifice. It's holy and acceptable. Um, in Leviticus, it talks about how the offerings are create an aroma that is pleasing and acceptable to the Lord, Right? And so you have all of it. And then Paul says, this is your spiritual worship. So how do we follow these footsteps? How are we worshiping God? And he says, well, you become a living sacrifice. Yeah, we're not doing the animal stuff anymore. We have Jesus. But that doesn't stop or change how we as God's people live. Though we still live holy lives. All right. And so our, our actions is what Paul is saying. The way we live, the way we obey God is now... The, the sacrificial aroma that we make to God. All right. <clears throat> All right. Then at the end of Leviticus 8, they get to have a meal together. And that's pretty cool. All right. They, Moses and Aaron and his sons eat the food. All right. And then they have a meal with God because God gets some of the food and they get some of the food. And so 
they're having fellowship with the Lord. So Leviticus 8, 31 says, And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of eating, and there eat it. And the bread that is in the basket of ordination offerings, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. And what remains of the flesh and the bread you shall burn up with fire. You shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed for it. For it will take seven days to ordain you. <laughs> I'm just thinking about my ordination service was pretty long or it felt really long. <laughs> seven days. You know, you have family members be like, we'll be back next week when the food's ready. Okay? <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> I have no idea why it took seven days. I'm sure because seven days of creation and seven is the perfect holy number of God and there's things like that. But I don't know. I just think it's funny. Mine was like a two-hour service and everybody else was like, well, it's pretty long. You know, so a seven-day service, you're like, how, how, how bad were you at seminary? Right? You know, it's like, <laughs> all right, so seven days to ordain you. As has been done today, the Lord has commanded to be done to make atonement for you at the entrance of the tent meeting. You shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, that you do not die, for so I have commanded you. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded by Moses. All right, so there's these strict rules. Aaron and his sons obey them. They are set apart, consecrated to serve the Lord through these sacrifices and offerings <clears throat> and at the end like I said they essentially have a meal with God they get fellowship with God and that becomes one of our joys of when we are serving in the way that God has called us and gifted us and he's done it in all kinds of different skill sets and talents and spiritual gifts which we need all of them to be a healthy church um, we are we get more joy. This is how it works. You will get joy out of serving the Lord and being in His presence and loving others. So, a couple of verses here at the end. I mentioned being a royal priesthood or a kingdom of priests. Depends on how you translate it. First uh, Peter chapter two picks up on this. He says, "But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation." a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's one of my favorite Bible verses. And here's what he's saying. You're a royal priesthood. That's language from the Old Testament, the kingdom of priests, royal priesthood. That's what the people of Israel call him. Peter's saying, you as the church now are the priesthood. Sometime, Luther called it the priesthood of all believers. And then he started doing a teaching called vocation, which meant you could serve God wherever in all of your relationships and all of your roles. You don't have to go be a monk. Right? No, it's his big idea. I didn't like that, so he was like, well, I'll go start my own thing. He didn't say that. They kicked him out. But <clears throat> the point that he was picking up on from the New Testament and like verses like this from Peter is that, you know, we're all part of the priesthood, meaning we all have been forgiven and consecrated by Jesus, right? We've all been anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit, as Paul said. And now we are all set apart with a purpose. You belong to God. The priests belong to God. That's why they stayed in the tabernacle. He says, no, you're a people of his own possession. You don't belong to yourself. You're not a master of your own destiny, okay? You belong to God. And it's for this purpose, though you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What Peter's saying in a very beautiful, poetic way is to proclaim the gospel, to tell people, this is what God did for me. This is the sin and the guilt and the shame that he rescued me out of. This is the darkness he brought me out of. And now I get to live in his light because of it. So <clears throat> you don't have to be a master theologian, right? You don't have to be a great orator or Bible teacher or any of those things. You just have to know Jesus, right? If you know Jesus and you know what he did for you, Peter's saying, you're in. You're a priest. You have a job. You have a role. All right, and then John 15, uh, last one here. John chapter 15. This is a great chapter. You should read the whole thing. John 15. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. That's not the part I'm reading, but it's in there. <laughs> My Bible is making me turn one page at a time. All right. <clears throat> John 15, verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. All right, so another very, this whole chapter is incredibly famous teachings of Jesus. <clears throat> but this part, he's talking about how we have been made friends of God. We are friends with Jesus, and he says, I've made known to you all that the Father wanted me to do and for you to know. And the comforting aspect of that is when Jesus says, I chose you and I appointed you. Jesus wants you to be his friend. And Jesus put you on his team. Right? We got, I got sports on the brain because of the Chiefs game later today. <laughs> you made it on the team Jesus. And that's really great. He's made you his friend. And he says, I've made known to you everything the Father made known to me that you need to know. Meaning... I've told you everything you need to know to love God, to love people. So we don't have to worry about this. Oh, well, that was Aaron. He was a high priest and all that. No, no, no. You're kingdom priests. Jesus chose you. He has pointed you. He has empowered you. He has gifted you. And he says, I've given you all the knowledge you need to know to, in order to serve him and his kingdom. 